Thank you for joining the community information session about executive function for adults with spina bifida. My name is Judy Thibodeau, and I'm SBA's National Director of Research and Services. I'm joined by my colleagues, Juanita Panliner, SBA's National Resource Manager, and Gianna Spear, SBA's Marketing and Communications Manager. I want to mention a few things before we get started. You will remain muted throughout the session, but we want your input. Please submit your, submit your questions using Zoom's Q&A feature. If we are unable to answer your questions during the presentation, we will address them in a follow-up, Ask the Expert session. We will provide details about that session when we send the email with today's recording. We are recording today's session. Everyone who registered for this event will receive a link to the recording. Closed captioning is enabled. The chat function will not be available today. If you have any technical issues, please email Juanita Panliner, J Panliner, P A N L E N E R, at sbaa.org. Now I am pleased to introduce Dr. Lisa Stanford. Dr. Stanford is a neuropsychologist with the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center Adult Spina Bifida Clinic and professor at the UPMC. Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, Dr. Stanford. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone, or good morning, depending upon where you live. <clears throat> we really appreciate you joining us, and I am honored to uh, accept this invitation to be able to talk to you a little bit about a, something that I love more than anything, and that's the brain. So I thought what we would do is talk a little bit about executive function and what that means, but in the context of um, spina bifida in particular, but not everyone, as we know, with spina bifida has executive dysfunction. So, but I wanted to kind of talk about it that way, give you a little bit of information about the brain and why we have difficulties sometimes with executive dysfunction. Um, and then talk a little bit about how do we address this in, in terms that are easily understood and manageable, but at the same time, recognizing that no approach to executive dysfunction is going to be the same for every person. So this is not going to be a webinar on how do we fix executive function. I just want to tell you a little bit about what it is and why we know that it affects people differently in spina bifida and why it affects a, a lot of people in a different manner. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so let's start with our shared assumptions. Every adult with spina bifida is unique. Not everyone is alike, right? We all have different experiences. Even with or without spina bifida, we are unique individuals and we're going to experience things very differently than someone else. However, we all need executive functions to live and adapt. All humans can show executive dysfunction at some level. It doesn't mean it's debilitating, but it does mean that it can have an impact and then we develop strategies to compensate. But there is some executive dysfunction. We may not even really realize it in ourselves. So hopefully you will learn something about executive functions tonight that you may not already know. Not all persons with spina bifida experience disruption from executive dysfunction. Our brain is beautifully adapted to come up with strategies to handle executive dysfunction and to allow us to continue to do those things day to day that, that function, uh, allow us to function appropriately and interact with others and meet our, our goals. Many adults with spina bifida have developed different strategies to manage executive function tasks. Not all executive dysfunction is the same. And of course, there's no one size fits all treatment for executive dysfunction. Next slide, please. So I know I can't talk to you in the way, but I like to think about what are executive function skills. So if uh, I don't know that we even have a way for you to type that in. So let's just go to the next slide. I thought I would present a YouTube video so that you could sort of see what popular culture sometimes thinks about executive function and to uh, kind of get you going and get your attention right off the bat. So if we could play the video. Hi guys, Dr. Lori Sesnick here from Mind Matters talking about executive functioning today. Executive functioning refers to the ability to organize and plan. When something goes wrong with executive functioning, you feel it and you know it.
executive functioning can be summarized as the ability to organize and plan. In fact, the word executive for executive functioning comes from the executor, meaning that part of your brain that organizes every other part of your brain. That is executive functioning. Executive functioning is often the first thing to go when we have a brain insult, like if you're in a car injury or whatnot, but you can also be born with weak executive functioning. All of us at some point or another, or some of us even every single day, can claim that we are unorganized and have a difficult time planning. And this is true, but there can be many reasons for that. Everything from just having too much on your plate, not enough support in your life to get things done, maybe lack of sleep, poor diet, a lot of things can make it hard for us to function daily. But if you were born with weak executive functioning, which is common with ADHD and, and other things, but if you were born with weak executive functioning and or acquired it from a head injury, it is debilitating to your life, absolutely debilitating. It can be hard to even function and get things done. In fact, it's fair to say that a disorder of executive function could be referenced as a disorder of performance, a performance disorder, because it's just really hard to get things done. Signs for weak executive functioning would be obviously lack of productivity. When you're disorganized, um, it's really hard to get started. So people who are disorganized tend to be huge procrastinators because they can't see how to get to the end. They cannot see how to get from A to B because they're in, of this inability to organize and plan in that, in that way. As a result, it is very hard for them to prioritize and to actually get things done. And some of them are going, going in circles and circles and circles all life long. It can be extremely frustrating. So signs for executive functioning, weak executive functioning, would be lack of productivity. You could see someone who has talent galore and you wonder why aren't they doing something with their life? Why aren't they moving forward? And often it can be due to weak executive functioning. They tend to be in the moment a lot, obviously, because if you can't plan ahead, you tend to be in the moment. So they'll struggle with long-term goals but they'll be fine with doing sort of tasky everyday things or very good with procrastinating, finding other things to um, <laughs> do with their time. Uh, they tend to have messy rooms, messy car, messy life, uh, can be easily overwhelmed and frustrated because of difficulty seeing ways out of things and coping, just difficult to, to get out. Obviously, they're prone to anxiety because of this difficulty organizing things and life can be hard. Uh, in around uh, childhood and adolescence, it can become evident with essay writing. Very hard for them to organize their thoughts to get them out onto paper. What do we do about weak executive functioning? The first thing you need to do is you need to have a full neuropsychological evaluation because there are many things that can lead to disorganization and weak planning. And like I said, everything from diet to lack of sleep and other things like inattention weak working memory, reasoning ability. A lot of things come into play when we're talking about it, uh, having difficulty with organization. So a neuropsych is imperative in this case. Deadlines, 100% necessary. When you have weak executive functioning, you cannot function without a deadline. In fact, people with weak executive functioning still tend to get things done at the last minute. They don't get started until they feel that feeling in their gut, like, oh no, I, this is due, and then they'll do it at the last minute. So they need to be on a schedule and they need to learn how to follow a daily schedule and they need someone to actually set that schedule up for them. Someone that's gonna help them plan out their annual goals, turn them into monthly, weekly, and daily goals and they need to learn how to follow those goals. Tips to follow those goals would be, learn, would be learning to feel the feeling you're gonna feel when you accomplish that goal. You have to bring that feeling into the now so that you feel it now. You have to remind yourself of what is that gonna feel like when I'm done, what will that feel like? And that should help motivate you on a daily basis to get things done. Get help to declutter your life. Get help to get things done that aren't as important as the big things, okay? You get someone to help you prioritize so you know what to prioritize and what to work on. And then when you need help with all the little things, maybe helping to clean your house or whatnot, get help, ask for help. Do not be afraid to ask for help. You are not lazy. You are not stupid. You have weak executive functioning. And there are many things that we can do to help it. And if you feel like you're lazy and you just can't get started, or you feel like you're a master procrastinator, it might be a good idea to get a neuropsych eval done just to see if this is something quite real. Hey guys, so that was Executive Functioning. I'm Dr. Lori Says from My Matters. See you next time.
So thank you all for bearing with me and my, uh, I, I'm, I'm convinced that I'm still stuck in adolescence because I find Jim Carrey hilarious, but he's probably the ultimate model of poor impulse control. So that's also an executive function as well. So I wait till we get back to the slides to keep going. Next slide, thank you. Okay, so how many of you saw yourself there? Maybe a little bit, maybe a lot, maybe not at all. And that's fine too. I will perfectly admit that there are days when my executive function is not at its best. There are other days where I'm on, and then there are other days where it varies throughout the day, depending upon how I feel, what I've eaten, how, my, how well I've slept, all of those things, how well we eat, if we exercise, um, if we've slept, if we have a uh, distraction-free setting, those are all things that really help our brain to do what we need to do to get things done throughout the day. So we may have executive dysfunction, we may not, but I would guarantee you that probably not everyone all the time is at full 100% great executive function. So when we think about executive functions, these are some examples. Emotional control, so that was uh, Jim Carrey not controlling his emotions very well, and so obviously he has some frontal lobe involvement there. Um, but that can be poor impulse control, that can be getting distressed, that can be getting mad easily and not being able to control your emotions. Um, it's not about controlling your sadness, but it's about having emotions that interfere with your day-to-day -day functioning and getting things done. Working memory is the ability to hold something in your mind while you're doing something with it. Um, so an example might be someone says, tell me your telephone excuse me, tell me your telephone number and they give you their number and I've got like the first two digits and I can't get the rest because I can't hold it long enough in my mind to hold it and write it down and remember it. The flexibility is that part of our brain that allows us to do something, shift and do something else and being flexible when what we try doesn't work and we need to generate a new solution. Planning is when we think about reaching a long-term goal and what are the steps necessary to get there to those goals. Task initiation is also a frontal lobe function and executive function, and that is beginning a task, knowing what we need to get a task, uh, what, what we need to get organized so that we can begin a task, and, and just sitting down and doing it sometimes is the hardest step for many, many people. Attention is also an executive function. There are many different types of attention. It can be immediate attention where we, well, iconic is actually faster than that, where we look at something, we pay attention to it, and then we shift to something else. And we don't even know that we've paid attention to it. Then there's immediate attention where we're paying us something. Then working memory requires us to rehearse it so we can do something with that information. Sometimes that information goes right out the other side of our head and out of our brains. So our working memory is not rehearsed it enough to store it. There's um, short-term memory, which is usually can be anywhere from, oh, I guess, uh, 20 to 30 minutes to a couple of weeks. And then we have longer term memory, which is more years. And then remote, remem remote memory is those things that we remember back in our past. So those are all kind of the basises for the many different types of attention that our brain challenges us to engage. And time management is just what it says, managing your time in a way to meet a goal and effectively develop strategies to get things done, knowing how long it takes to get something done. Metacognition, meta just means about or around, and that is about cognition. So metacognition is what do you think about what you think, if you want to put it simply. That's our brain's ability to kind of monitor what we're thinking and what we're doing and make decisions while we're thinking and doing that and still maintain that in our mind to do the next task. Next slide, please. All right, why does executive dysfunction affect some people with spina bifida? Again, not everyone. But it can result in people with spina bifida from disruption to the frontal lobe, so disruption to the development of the frontal lobe. It may mean that the frontal lobe doesn't fully form, given that the neural tube issue that we're going to talk about in a little bit, or it could be impacted by other um, congenital or other conditions, like it could be obstructive, as in hydrocephalus, or you may have more central nervous system involvement, and that has a direct proportion to the level of executive dysfunction you might have and the disruption to your frontal lobe development. Your frontal lobe can develop in a typical fashion as in terms of speed and temporal 
uh, uh, you know, how it occurs in time and space, but it might change in its trajectory because of something that might have happened to you, like a shunt malfunction or something of that sort. And if you have different levels of symptom severity, that can impact your executive function. And also, depending upon the level of where your spina bifida occurs along the spine can have implications for how someone experiences executive dysfunction or whether they do or whether they don't. Next slide, please. So my favorite uh, part of the day is always thinking about the brain. And I want to focus on the frontal lobes, which is the pink part in the picture up in the top, uh, my left, up in the top left as you're looking at the screen. But we do have parietal lobe, temporal lobe, and occipital lobe. And it's not so demarcated and delineated as this picture would suggest. Everything works together. And so I'm not going to say executive dysfunction or executive functions occur only in the frontal lobes. That's just not correct. It occurs throughout the brain and your frontal lobe really goes to other areas of the brain, asks it things, looks for things, pulls things forward so that you can do something with it. So it really is sort of the parent of the brain in a way that helps our other areas of the brain work together um, send information for output and behavior. So when I say behavior, I don't mean bad behavior. What I mean is the outward display of what our brain is asking us to do. But when you look at this in the frontal lobe, forward, forward, that pink and blue come together uh, in the larger picture, that central sulcus is the dividing line. A sulcus is like a crevice and a gyri is a puffy part. That's the technical term, right? And so you have your motor cortex, you have your sensory cortex, and then you have your frontal eye fields and you have all those things that happen in that frontal part of our brain that help us with decision-making and executive function, but also with motor control and sensory experience. Next slide, please. And I talked about the the primary motor cortex. This is a flip side of the frontal, but if you look at the homunculus in the bottom left-hand corner, homunculus means little man, um, but for those of us who are gender neutral, I'm going to say little person, and this is a, a, a depiction of how our brain represents different areas of our body on the brain by location. So that primary motor cortex really controls the direction of our movements and basic movements and motor functioning. And the larger the picture representation is of the particular part of the body, the greater the representation there is in that primary motor cortex. So that allows us to, when we speak and pull words, and you can see tucked down in the top uh, in our, our legs. So anytime we have motor dysfunction in our legs, we know that the issue occurs at a much deeper, deeper level down in the brain rather than out on the surface of the brain. Next slide. Okay, so this is something probably all of you know. I just wanted to review though. Spina bifida actually means split spine or two spine. Um, it can be incomplete closure of the amniotic neural tube. It can also be occulta, which is hidden. It could be a cyst uh, uh, on the bottom of or anywhere along the spinal cord. And if it's a meningocele, it means it has meninges or tissue in it. And seal means sac, so sac of tissue versus cystica with a milo meningocele. Milo, the word means white. So if you have a milo meningocele, you have a sac filled with white matter, nerve tissue, and meninges. So that's different than just a meninges seal that doesn't have any of your spinal cord nerve tract out in that seal. Next slide, please. Neural tube defect. So this is what spina bifida is. It's called a neural tube defect. And an NTD is really an opening in the spinal cord or the brain that occurs very early in human development within the first three weeks. And there are two types of neural tube defects, open, which we just talked about, myelomeningocele, acephaly means without brain or lack of brain. Encephalocele means head or brain and a seal at the base of the brain. So those are the types of neural tube developments that are open. I'm sorry, neural tube defects that are open. There are rare types of neural tube defects that are called closed neural tube defects. And those occur when the spinal defect is covered by skin and it might be fatty tissue. And so that could be a lipo, myelo, meningocele. So lipo means fat. Milo, remember, white matter. Meninges is tissue in a sac. Lipo, again, that's the sac without the uh, nervous system tissue and then tethered cord where the cord, the bottom of the spinal cord has been frayed like a rope. And then spina bifida occulta is, is, occurs when there's typically benign or non-symptomatic bony changes in one or more of the vertebra, but the nerves are not involved within that column. Next slide, please. 
So our brain develops, we all start from a plate. Our brain starts from a plate, it forms into a tube. This way, I don't know if you can see my hands, but I'm acting it out, but it forms into a tube. And then it moves into our primary brain. And the primary brain is involved with the prosencephaly, mesencephaly, and rhombencephaly. Pro means forward. And that makes sense that forward brain, mesen means middle. So that makes sense that that would be the middle part of the brain. And then rhombin means back. And that's the cephalon, the back part of the brain. And these areas on the side over there are the, those parts. Less important, but just recognizing that we all start from the neural plate, the tube folds over, and sometimes it doesn't close properly at one end or the other. And that is the contribution of spina bifida. Next slide, please. So at 21 days, you can see that the head and the back have started to form the spinal cord and you can see it comes out of that plate that's folded over on itself kind of like a pea pod in a way a reverse pea pod we're closing it at 22 days it starts to close even more but you still have openings at the top and at the bottom for the brain at the top and the rest of the spinal cord and everything else that comes below that and then by 28 days it's supposed to have fused uh, appropriately across that and when you have a spina bifida defect it doesn't close by the 30 day mark Next slide, please. This is just a, you can't see at the top, but the numbers are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, et cetera. Those are weeks. And just wanted to give you an idea that the first two weeks when someone is pregnant, a lot of things are happening and cells divide and the embryo is implanted and it starts to formulate. And then by that third week, our central nervous system is starting to form and our spinal cord and our brain and the heart. And so you can see that the purple indicates that these are things that are happening during that time. Um, and uh, the central nervous system continues into the blue on the right side. The heart is formed, upper limbs, lower limbs, IT. So depending upon when some type of disruption to development occurs, you can understand how that then can translate to day-to-day -to -day behavior and body function depending upon when that occurred in utero. Next slide, please. This is a table from a 2002 web, but it still holds true. And this just gives you the depiction of the spinal cord, what occulta might look like and that there's the defect in the closure and it might just be a skin depression or a dimple or a tuft of hair. And that might be the only thing that's obvious versus in a meninge seal, the, the meninges protrude through the part, open part and it's usually with little or no nerve damage or disability. And then in the myelomeningocele, the meninges protrudes, but also the central nervous system um, uh, and the spinal cord comes in that as well. And you have some lower extremity paralysis or loss of sensation, neurogenic bladder and bowel, and then also possibly hydrocephalus, depending upon if there are other things that occur. Next slide, please. This is a rendition that's been around for a long, long time by Frank Netter, who's an excellent uh, anatomical drawer. And this on the left shows the meningocele, and on the right, the myelomeningocele. And then at the bottom, the myelomeningocele, what it looks like prior to any kind of surgical intervention. Next slide, please. As I said earlier, depending upon what other comorbid symptoms or things that occur, that occur along with spina bifida will determine how much executive dysfunction you might have or other cognitive issues. And Chiari malformation type two is one of those. 80 to 90% of patients with a myelomeningocele have a Chiari type two, and it's always associated with hydrocephalus. So what is Chiari type two? Let's go to the next slide. This is a picture and you can see the arrow and the Chiari is a little tonsil that falls down below, down into the fourth ventricle. And you can see as it goes down into that fourth ventricle, it makes it very difficult for the cerebral spinal fluid to circulate around and go down into the fourth ventricle. This, the picture on the right is what that looks like down in the spinal cord as well when you don't get adequate, and if it, adequate CSF and it's blocked up. Now, if the CSF or central uh, cerebral spinal fluid is blocked, of course, you might have hydrocephalus and you may not, and you may need a shunt and you may not. But the point of, of talking about this is if you have a Chiari, that increases the likelihood that you may have more cognitive involvement associated with spina bifida. And if you also have hydrocephalus where it's backed up, then you can have compression and tissue dies when fluid compresses that tissue and the frontal lobe is the most sensitive to that. So it makes sense that if you have a Chiari and hydrocephalus, you might have more executive dysfunction than someone with spina bifida occulta or someone with spina bifida without those things and then that involvement.
Cerebral spinal fluid is very important to our brain. It creates nutrients and, and allows the brain to be buoyant and not bang up against the bony ridges of our skull. But it is also a barrier between the blood and our brain to filter out radicals, free radicals, and things like that that can cause, cause harm to our brain. So we want to make sure that that production is even and that it flows well and that it's not obstructed. Next slide, please. Hydrocephalus is when you have an imbalance in the production and absorption of that CSF. So production means your brain is producing a lot of cerebral spinal fluid and it's typically absorbed pretty easily, but if it isn't, then a shunt helps you absorb and get rid of that so it doesn't build up into your brain. Um, or you can have typical production and not overproduction, but yet you're blocked and you can't get that cerebral spinal fluid out and throughout the area. So there's different ways in which hydrocephalus can impact the brain. But if there's too much buildup of fluid, that is going to kill tissue underneath. And that's going to have an implication for how your brain functions and how you're able to perform tasks that require executive skills. Uh, it can be an interruption in the normal circulation and that enlarges the ventricles and then that puts pressure on the surrounding brain structures. It's not a disease entity by itself, but there are many, many conditions that result in hydrocephalus, but I'm just talking about it specifically in the context of buildup of cerebral spinal fluid that requires shunting or some other mechanism to reduce the fluid on the brain as in spina bifida that might occur with a Chiari malformation. You can also have hydrocephalus without a Chiari malformation because you could overproduce, um, but that's uh, the most common is to have a Chiari malformation that tucks down from the cerebellum and blocks the flow, the easy flow of that CSF. Next slide, please. Okay, this is what a typical brain might look like with ventricles. You can see there's a temporal horn there, the little holes, a frontal horn, the lateral ventricles, occipital horn, fourth ventricle. These are all uh, pathways or canals in the brain that allow cerebral spinal fluid, uh, fluid to flow from the brain and leave the brain and circulate around the brain. They are holes within, but the next slide shows you what hydrocephalus looks like in the brain. Next slide, please. So you can see those ventricles are extremely enlarged and you don't see the demarcations that you saw in the other. Um, this is the tissue, the fluid takes up a lot more space than the typical brain and as you saw in the slide previously. So this is why having hydrocephalus and have that be untreated can have significant impacts and obviously we have shunt now a new technology that allows us to treat hydrocephalus and minimize the impact on our, our brain's development. Next slide. Okay, so Obviously, we can't answer all of this, but I will say that all of these things affect me to some degree. So how many of you find it difficult to pay attention? How many of you might forget appointments? You might procrastinate. You can't figure out how long it will take for a task to be completed. You might have a disorganized home and workspace. You may struggle to complete more than one task at a time or just tasks in general. You might talk out of turn or interrupt others. You might do things without thinking through those consequences. Uh-oh, that's me, big one. Um, you might get stuck and you can't switch off something or let something go when you're mad about it or upset and you ruminate about it. Or you can't switch to another task before you've completed the first task, but then you forgot what you've done on that task and then you can't move to the next task. Having difficulty following more than one instruction at a time, getting frustrated when things change and you don't expect it. And we, none of us really like change that much. Change can be good, but it's also overwhelming if you're not sure what to do when you're confronted with that change. And then how many of you say things that hurt your friends or family and you can't figure out why you have no idea what you said or didn't say, you just know that someone has expressed that they're upset at you. These are all examples of executive dysfunction or executive functions that may from time to time interfere. It doesn't have to be at the level of dysfunction. This can happen sometimes, not always, and you won't have all of these at once, but occasionally we all likely have experienced many of these issues. Next slide. And it's typically executive functions are in three domains. And we think about behavior and emotions. We think about social situations and relationships, and we think about learning. So executive function is a set of cognitive or mental processes or abilities that allow us to connect past experience, our thoughts, our actions, our behavior, our consequences with the present action in order to generate that behavioral response and respond to that. Next slide, please. These are the behavioral components. So we've talked a little bit about these on the slide at the very beginning. So impulse control, and that's the ability to stop and think before you're acting or speaking. 
That's emotional control, the ability to manage feelings while you're thinking about goals. Um, that is the planning and prioritizing where you, the ability to create steps and to reach a goal and make decisions about one, uh, about what should have our focus. Flexibility is that ability to change strategies or revise plans when conditions change. Thank you for the heart. I was a uh, working memory, so I saw that come up. Thank you so much. Working memory is the ability to hold information in one's mind while using it to complete a different task. Self-monitoring is the ability to monitor and evaluate your performance. And task initiation, the ability to recognize when it's time to get started on something and begin without procrastinating. And organization, the ability to create and maintain systems to keep track of information or our materials. Next slide. So that's a lot of behavior, right? We're always doing that. We're always trying to manage our environment. We're always trying to find ways to navigate and we don't all do it well, but some of us have really good skills in that and can help others and generate those, um, um, generate those strategies that can be very effective. So here's some ways that we can address them. But as I said at the very beginning, this is not a how to address executive dysfunction. I just want to give you an idea what executive functions are and recognize that we're all humans, whether we have um, uh, something that interferes or not, we're going to experience some of those issues and that's okay. But there are ways to help and one might be with an American with Disabilities Act accommodations plan at home or at school and a neuropsychological evaluation actually can help identify strengths and weaknesses. Sorry, I had to get two plugs in for neuropsych eval because we can be very helpful in letting you understand more about your brain because all our brains are different. We all do some things well, we all do some things not so well, and that's different for everyone. So the evaluation can help us identify it so that we can then create a plan, either at home or at school. You also can get an executive function coach or even someone, sometimes our parents are a coach and we don't want them to be, right? When we're adults and our parents are still telling us what to do and still trying to help us manage our executive functions. But I really believe in supporting people and helping people determine what is best for me? How can I do this? And um, I work with a lot of parents of adults with spina bifida to say, the first thing is to allow your um uh, offspring, I don't want to say child, allow your offspring with spina bifida to be an adult. That is so, so important. And with adulthood comes executive function. Our executive functions don't fully kick in and aren't fully working until age 25 or later. So that that's why adolescence is so bad because we just don't have any frontal lobes then. And people with spina bifida, often the trajectory has been changed, as I said at the beginning, or they have a failure to develop a frontal lobe in the same way that someone else might that doesn't have executive, that doesn't have spina bifida or that someone that has spina bifida with a low level of symptomatology. So these are ways that you can get a coach or you can have someone in your life. We all have a, uh, probably some devices, assistive devices, our watch, our apps, things that tell us when to wake up, when to do that. There are some really good apps for executive dysfunction. I'm going to pass those along to the SBA team so that you can have access to those. But you can get a coach, a formal coach that does this for a living. You can have a therapist that helps you with executive functions, or you can have a friend that really helps keep you on task. But developing a plan and knowing your own strengths and weaknesses is really critical to addressing uh, executive functions in your day-to-day -day life. Every person is different, so each plan or treatment, treatment must be tailored. Not everything is going to work for everybody. I could come up with a million different things to do for executive dysfunction, but it's not going to apply to everyone. It's not going to work for everyone, and it's just not going to always be as effective. So I encourage you to find out as much as you can about your brain and then use that information to then determine how you can help yourself and uh, get others to support you in your executive functions. Next slide, please. And so Dr. Stanford, before we move forward, um, we do have a couple of questions that I thought uh, might be good for now. Awesome. Um, the, the first one is, if you have kids, could they have these symptoms from you genetically if they don't have an NTD? Or is it most likely from the other parent that has ADHD? So let's back that up because not every person with ADHD has executive dysfunction, but ADHD is genetic. Um, it is passed from family member to family member and you can have associated executive dysfunction. So I'm kind of going to break that question up a little bit. Um, but executive dysfunction is not inherited. 
it's usually associated with a certain disorder. So if you have ADHD, yes, you, you can pass along that executive dysfunction if you have ADHD and that's a primary symptomatology. If you have spina bifida with executive dysfunction and you have no parent with ADHD or executive dysfunction, it is very unlikely, but we all learn from our environment. So if you, as a, a parent, and you have spina bifida and you have a child with executive dysfunction and you as a parent have executive dysfunction, it's very difficult to teach someone to manage their executive function. So that can sometimes be worse and it's based on our environment. So getting help with each other, uh, getting help within each other and in the family can be helpful, but it is not an, a heritable trait of executive dysfunction. We all have it. We all have it at least up until age 20. We just do. And our brain has to continue to mature. And as our brain matures, that tends to interfere less and less with our life. So two things happen. Our brain continues to develop and mature so that we develop better executive functions as we get older, or the converse, or actually comorbid thing that happens, the demands get harder. So you can be catching up and getting executive function skills and doing great, and then boom, a new demand comes and you fall apart and can't quite get it. But I know that people say, oh, I don't have executive dysfunction. Well, I'm telling you, we as human beings all have that. But by and of itself, it is not a heritable trait. I hope that answered your question. Thank you. And then we have another question, uh, which is, where can we find, where can one find an executive function coach? And what's, what should you search for online? Yeah, so you can search for executive function coach, right? But you also, I'm going to try to create a list of resources for all of you and send that in so that you'll have it um, uh, available. And I think that we're also going to have a follow up uh, question and answer session as well. So I want to make sure that I gather everything that would be helpful. But there are formal and informal executive function coaches. So it just depends. So those of you who know me and who've worked with me or I've seen you in the clinic, I do work with people on executive function and what that looks like and building a plan. Um, it's really helpful to have things written down so that someone at your work or if you're still in school so that they follow that or even in your home environment so that your family knows how to best support you within that. But I will provide some resources with coaches, but you really can literally just Google executive function coach and see if there's some locally or not. And my uh, social worker, Amy Kiska, who's in our spina bifida clinic also is going to compile a list so that we have some people that are um, uh, local for our group, but also for those of you that are not local, I'm happy to do some research and get information that's uh, located in your area. Thank you so much. And uh, we do have a couple more. I don't know if you can see them. Um, so I don't know um, if this is a good time to, uh, sure. to address them, but okay, great. So another one is, how does one actually diagnose or document executive dysfunction so that they can request reasonable ac accommodations in either a school, higher education, or work situation? By having a neuropsychological evaluation. So that is the key. A neuropsych let me explain what that is so that all of you know what that is. So as I said, I'm a neuropsychologist. I'm a lifespan neuropsychologist. A lifespan neuropsychologist doesn't mean that I see people at different ages. What it means is that I have an understanding of the brain and how it changes over the lifespan in the context of a disease or disorder or injury process. So that's very different than just seeing people at different ages, right? It's that understanding that the brain is impacted throughout the lifespan um, by co-occurring diseases or other things. A neuropsychological evaluation can be paper and pencil tests, having you do hands-on tasks, answering questions, doing things that are designed to let me look at your brain and see what your brain does well, what it doesn't do well. And then I use that information from that evaluation to really help you understand what do I do well, what do I not do well, and why do I not do it well? And we use that information to then come up with very specific accommodations. Examples of those accommodations might be extra time on a test if it's in school, because you are so busy looking around, the, I'll, I'll use me, because I'm so busy looking around the room that I often forget to pay attention to the exam, and then the time is up, and boom! So I need extra time so that I can make sure that I complete a task. 
or you can have a proctor that says, okay, let's go back and check your work. Or you can have a scribe, someone to take notes for you if it's difficult for you to listen to a lecture and take notes or look at the whiteboard and take notes. Those are working memory tasks. So you can put a plan in place that allows those things to not be as interfering with your learning or in your work. An accommodation on work might be extra time to manage your bowel and bladder missing work and not being penalized because you have medical appointments, um, giving you reminders and showing you lists instead of pictures, you know, and, and until you know what your brain is doing and how well you can process information, you can't really develop an ADA accommodations plan that's appropriate for you. Like I said before, it's tailored to you. So an evaluation will allow you to understand your brain strengths and weaknesses and then use that to then tailor that plan either in school or in work or work with your family to help you and support you at home. I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Um, okay, so here we have a two-part question. Okay. Um, or two, okay. So what eliminates or illuminates the difference between ADHD and executive function disorder? Oh, I I love this question. You're going to get me on a soapbox. So thank you for giving me a forum. I appreciate it. So I don't like the, the diagnosis ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, with or without hyperactivity, inattention, et cetera. And the reason I don't like it is in our manual, how we diagnose this, it doesn't specify cause. There are a million different ways to have to get inattention, some impulsivity, some fidgetiness, distractibility, and none of which is ADHD. There's a million different ways. So to me, there is a probably a pure ADHD that's a genetic ADHD that's passed in family, but everything else that's diagnosed as ADHD really is just the behavioral manifestation of a different process. Might be how spina bifida affects your frontal lobes. It might be how a head injury affects your frontal lobes. It might be how something else, a disease or illness or infection affects your brain function. So ADHD is a behavioral diagnosis and you check off how much you have of that. And to me, that is just not a good explanation for executive function. So executive dysfunction or executive function are the processes by which an individual might demonstrate good or not so good development based on any other condition they might have in their brain. And it can be completely separate from ADHD and it is not always present in ADHD, and ADHD is not always present in spina bifida. I see those as two separate disorders, but there's a lot of people out there that would disagree with me, and that's okay. And the next question of this two-part question is, who can I see besides a neuropsychologist to be tested? Having Medicaid is proving to be difficult to find a neuropsych who does evaluations, or do you have other ideas on how to get evaluated with Medicaid? Yes, yeah, so there are many neuropsychologists that do accept Medicaid, depending upon where you are, especially if it's the mission of the hospital to take care of you, and we are one of those places. Um, but yes, you're right. You can't always get access to a neuropsychologist. Those are the best people to let you know because it can be very thorough, and you don't have to have a complete um, to see the neuropsychologist for everything school related, the school, if you're in school, the school can do some of the eval and a neuropsychologist might, um, but it really just a regular psychologist who's not trained as a neuropsychologist wouldn't be the most appropriate person. Um, it's very difficult to to get those kinds of evaluations. And I hear you. And, and that's why we're advocating on a national level to make sure that those things are paid for or that families are not charged for those evaluations if their uh, Medicaid benefits don't cover. But for all other medical insurances, it is covered and can be gotten. But you are absolutely right. And I don't pretend to know the answer to fix the healthcare system and how billing works, especially for Medicaid. Um, but, but it's not just a gold standard, a neuropsych eval. It really is essential to give you that information. Um, you can sometimes go to the disability office and they will give you an evaluation and then you can talk to a psychologist to help you understand that evaluation if you've been identified, but it's not as comprehensive as a neuropsychological evaluation. But I so appreciate that question. That, that is something that I've spent my career for 33 years trying to fight against and making sure that everyone has equal access and equity in determining how their brain is functioning because it can be so very helpful. So I have one that might be quick. I'm not sure. What exactly is communicating hydrocephalus? Ah, thank you. That's a great question. 
communicating means it talks, right? It talks to others. So that means it's not obstructed. It is allowed to go through. And that was that overproduction. There's so much production and it communicates everywhere, meaning it's there. Non-communicating is obstructive, meaning it can't communicate with the rest of the brain. So you can have communicating and non-communicating or absorption or obstructed. Those are the same things and used interchangeably uh, in the way that I presented those. But just think about it. the good way to remember it is communicating. It's able to communicate with other areas, meaning it's not being blocked. So it can go around and do what it needs to do, but there's too much of it. Whereas non-communicating or obstructive means there's something getting in the way and it's building up behind that. Excellent question. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Well, we have a few more and I think this one might also be related to this slide. Okay. Um, it says, hi, I'm struggling with the line between, I can't help it, I have trouble with executive dysfunction because I have spina bifida. And that's just an excuse. It's something I can work on and change, stop using it as a crutch, et cetera. Wowzer. So, um, gosh, I have lots of thoughts about that, but it is not a crutch. It is something that we cannot help and we all experience it. So someone who's going to say to you, I don't have executive dysfunction. Why do you get over it? That's like telling somebody who's depressed to stop being sad. That doesn't work, right? And so that's an insensitive response. So I would say the best way that I would address that for myself is to come up with a way to respond to that comment in a way that self-advocates for me, but also uh, speaks my own truth. And so what I might say is, I appreciate that you don't have the same issues that I do, but it's very difficult for me. And I would like very much if you could support me, but I completely understand if you view that as a crutch. Not all of us can do everything really, really well. And boom, I like to kind of shut that down. Did that help and, at all? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> no, thank you so much for that. And then yeah. here's another one. Um, I feel like I was fine in school until about early 20s and then started having problems. Yeah. If you've had if you've had two neuropsych evals and no executive function dis, dysfunction is detected, does that mean you don't have it? What could no. the problem be? Yeah, that means you probably had a bad neuropsychological evaluation perhaps um, because there are many tests that are very sensitive and can be very helpful, but there's not a lot. I mean, not all neuropsychologists are created equal, right? So they may not necessarily have evaluated you in the best way. But what happens is, and our tests aren't always sensitive. I, I'm not here to say that we can pick up everything. We can't. And so what happens, as I said earlier, the demands get harder. So as the demands get harder, it might show up more. We have more stressors. We can't sleep. We get sad. All of those things interfere. So sometimes it's about tackling one of those or each of those things at a time to eliminate that you may not have. You may have executive dysfunction, but it may not be a cognitive process. It may be that other things like your sleep, or your eating habits or your lack of exercise or the being in too much of a stressful situation are really illuminating those executive dysfunctions when you don't technically show it in a one-on-one -on -one distraction free tetting setting in testing that could be very true what what could have happened All right thank you and so i'm going to let you keep going with the rest of your presentation we do have a few more questions but maybe we can let you finish okay I don't even know where we are. So see, there's my working memory boop, right out the window. So let's just see what the next slide holds for us, shall we? Oh, it's the end. Look, it's the weekend. We can indulge in all our vices. We can overindulge every day of the week. Yeah, but you don't have to feel guilty. So we are two questions. Go right ahead. <laughs> and I love that slide. Okay. Well, um, I like the brain and the heart. There's always that, you know, gosh, we got to take care of our heart, but also our brain. And, but, you know, sometimes we don't always make the best choices and that's an executive dysfunction right there. <laughs> So one question is, where can we find general ideas or resources to get general ideas to help since I understand each person is different? Sure. And so I will tell you that there's a lot of ADHD websites that are going to give you clues about, even though I don't like that it's totally connected with ADHD, you can find some very effective resources there. The National Association of Learning Disabilities has a lot of good uh, information because there are often sometimes co-occurring learning disabilities in spina bifida. And many of the learning issues, as I said early on, are a result of executive dysfunction. So the National Council for Learning Disabilities, NCLD, the National Association of Learning Disabilities, CHAD, um, that's the Association for Children and Adults with ADHD. And then, of course, our Spina Bifida Association probably has lots of resources as well. And I'm going to provide additional ones. Great. Thank you. And um, if you had a neuropsych eval as a teen, 
Should you get another at 28? Who does that as primary care? Yeah, so primary care doesn't do that. Uh, That would be someone like me um, or an adult neuropsychologist because your brain changes from the time you were a teenager. Remember, your frontal lobes kind of come in a little bit. They get a little bit better. You're going to look very different. IQ can change. People say, oh, no, IQ is stable. No, it changes. If you don't feel good or don't do well, we our tests measure a million different things, only one of which is intelligence. So if you don't feel well, you're not, you didn't sleep well, you're going to perform poorly on a test and that changes over time. So having another data point within three years is helpful to building an ADA plan. It has to be within three years if you're under age 25 and within five years if you're over age 25 in order to build an accommodations plan. Now, usually after 30 or 35, if you've had an evaluation as an adult, you don't need another one, but some people will come and I see people that are in their 50s and they've never had one and it can be very, very useful. So I would say, yes, I would get another one if I were you, if you just had it as a teen, because your brain has done many, many things and changed since then. And here's another one. I've had some memory issues for much of my life where I've had trouble remembering people's names and other details literally minutes after them telling me. Is that a shunt issue? And if so, what can I do about it? Oh my gosh, I love this question. You guys are awesome. So that's not even a memory issue. That's an attention issue. So remember where I said there are different types of attention and that not remembering something 10 minutes later or whatever, that's attention. That means you had it, you heard their name, it was in your working memory, Boop, right out the other ear, never got stored. So that is not memory loss. That's an attentional issue. So developing a strategy to either write down someone's name or say, say it again to me, and then creating something in your mind to connect it will help you. But you'll have to use specific strategies. That is not a memory issue. That is not a shunt issue. That is typical inattention to where you didn't uh, hold it in your mind long enough to store it and it went out before you got that stored. That is very common. That's attentional issue, not memory. Now, shunt can cause that, but it doesn't happen gradually like that. Typically, when it's shunt related, it's much more acute and much more severe. And so you have trouble learning all kinds of new things, not just remembering someone's name. But that is both a attention issue, but also a retrieval issue, because here's what some of us do. When we hear someone's name, we remember it, we put it in our brain, and then we can't find where we put it in our brain. So when we go to find it and pull it out, it's not there. And that's a frontal lobe thing too, because we didn't organize it well. So if you think about your brain as a file cabinet, and I say, okay, Lisa, go over to that file cabinet and put this report in there. And if I just stick it in there and shut the drawer and you tell me later, okay, Lisa, go find it. I'm like, what the heck? Where did I put that? But if you say to me, okay, Lisa, I want you to put it in the one third left side of that alphabetized and put it there. When I go back to find it later, I'm going to know exactly where it is. And so that's the problem with executive dysfunction. We don't know where we put stuff so we can't find it. So developing some strategies and memorizing, and it's okay to say to someone, I am terrible with names. Let me get your name again. And I'm going to either write it down or I'm going to try to think of some way that I can best remember your name, but please be, um, Um, please be respectful of me that I don't always remember names very well, but it's really about attention. It's not that you don't want to pay attention. It's not that you didn't pay attention. It's just the way that your brain has stored that information or not stored it. Great. Um, And since each person is different in their journey with spina bifida, and there are many levels of function, Is it wise to say that all persons with spina bifida should be labeled with executive function issues? Well, I'm not a big label person, so I don't like to label anyone with anyone, with anything. I like to accept people where they are, find out about them, listen to them, what they're experiencing, and then answer their questions or provide a plan based on that rather than giving a universal label. I just don't think that does anyone any good, but that's just my personal opinion. Thanks for the heart. And um, let's see here. This one is that this seminar has blown my fragile little mind. (laughs) <laughs> but man, this information is so good and eye-opening and reassuring. I think I had a neuropsychological evaluation in school and had an accommodation plan, and I'm not sure it helped me, or maybe it wasn't strong enough, but that's been 25 years. I'll never be able to thank you enough for your hard work in your field, and you have put me at ease that I can and will thrive past 43. Oh, my goodness. That means so much to me. That just means so much to me. This is why I do what I do. And I, I just really appreciate you sharing that with me. Thank you so much. Thanks for all and the hearts. You people are awesome. 
<laughs> and we and we have a few more minutes. I'm going to just keep throwing questions at you. Okay. Um, I was told my son with spina bifida is extremely slow at processing information. Could this be a problem with executive functioning? Yes, ma'am. So speed up processing is an executive function. Remember when I said Milo means white and the white matter tracks in the brain? That's like our information highway. And if we got speed bumps or potholes on an information highway, it doesn't go very fast, does it? And so there can be speed bumps. It doesn't mean he can't process. It means he needs more time. It's not an all or nothing. It's not like I can process or I can't. You can have slower processing. That is an executive dysfunction. That's okay. The accommodation is to get more time and to tell people to chill out and stop expecting people to turn on a dime and do stuff so quickly. That's just not the way we need to be living. And so being gentle with him and allowing him extra time and having that built into any accommodations plan at job or at the school or where they live, that will be so very important. And do you know if health insurance will cover a neuropsychological evaluation? Yes, it does, except for Medicaid in some states, depending upon the state and the institution. But one of the things that we do at UPMC is we um, have waivers and we also will uh, work with uh, family for financial support if that's something that they really, really need. And we try to make it uh, not as cost prohibitive. So we don't want our families getting extra bills on top of what they're already paying for their medical. Right. So one thing would be is um, if you're concerned, I see that um, this person mentioned that they have Blue Cross Blue Shield of Georgia, would be to contact them directly and, yes. and find out. Yes. In most states, Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, we neuropsychologists are billing under medical, not mental health. So if they send you to a behavioral health carve out, say, no, no, no. I heard a doctor and they said, neuropsychologist is a medical professional and it needs to be under my medical plan, not my behavioral health or mental health plan. That'd be very adamant about that. But I can't answer specific questions about states in which I am not uh, licensed or practice. Okay. And is executive dysfunction related to why people struggle with math? I've always struggled with it in learning and understanding, even as an adult now, the only thing that really helps is repetitive, repetitiveness and learning. So I'm going to tell you that I have a math learning disability. I cannot add or subtract. I use my fingers regularly and I did okay. So I hear you, I feel your pain. Math learning disability or math issues is separate from executive dysfunction, but certainly holding numbers in your mind like phone numbers, that can be part of it. But actually, math is related to disruption to the non-dominant right hemisphere, right posterior of the brain that often occurs in any kind of congenital disorder. So that's why visual spatial skills, that's why social skills, that's why knowing where your body is in space and how close to stand, that's why all those things can be difficult for some people with spina bifida because their non-dominant right hemisphere has also been affected. The reason for that is our left hemisphere develops first because we are a language society. So our body and when our brain is forming protects itself at all costs to make sure the left hemisphere survives. Anytime you have something congenital or something with which you're born, then the right non-dominant hemisphere takes a bigger hit because it's a backup hemisphere. And those things that are just in the right hemisphere usually are facial recognition, visual spatial aspects of math, and us, right, left confusion, all of those things have to do with it. So it's more related to in spina bifida, the non-dominant right hemisphere, rather than purely your frontal lobes and your executive functions. Okay, and we are beginning to run out of time. So I'll just maybe just ask one more question and just want to tell everybody that has all these open questions that we will be having a follow-up session on Thursday, August 10th, if that's correct, Dr. Stanford. That I believe correct. that that was the day. <laughs> we will have a follow-up session on Thursday, August 10th. So please save that date. We will be sending more information out when we send out the recording. And that will be an Ask the Expert session. So you can ask all the questions you want for, for Dr. Stanford. Um, and um, I don't know if you want to just, uh, just one, I don't know if this is a short one or not, one quickie here. Can the chronic usage of social media and the internet worsen executive dysfunction? Yes. Hmm. <laughs> How's that for short? <laughs> There you go. There you go. <laughs> Fabulous. Thank you so much. And so um, with that, we don't know how to, we appreciate this so much. And I think you can tell from 
all the bubbles. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you. This just uh, makes it worthwhile what I do. Thank you. Thank you. And for those who did submit questions, uh, Zoom will save your questions so that um, we will gather them and um, use them for the presentation that we will do on August 10th. And it will also be at the same time, 7 p.m. Eastern time. And before we end, um, I'll just, uh, again, thank you so much, Dr. Stanford. And uh, I'll turn this back to Judy, who's going to close us off. You're welcome. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Juanita. Thanks, Dr. Stanford. This is a, a topic of great importance to our community. And we appreciate your comments and, and community out there. We really appreciate your involvement with SBA and attending these sessions and look forward to our more conversation on August the 10th with you and Dr. Stanford. So thanks, thanks everyone and good night. Thank you all. Good night.